This is the highlight of my week, getting to talk with these two gentlemen. So I'm really thrilled that you're here with me today to join this conversation. Uh, I want to start by thanking both of you for being with me. Uh, John, you have been, become a friend um, and have been a great supporter of Singularity University over the years. It's wonderful to have you here today. Uh, Professor Christensen, Clay, uh, it's a real honor to have you here. I can't, uh, I have been a client of Insights. I have been a great fan of your work, and it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you today. So we don't have that much time, and I have tons of questions that I want to ask these gentlemen. So I'm going to get right into it. So I want to spend most of our time today talking about how large established organizations uh, what they must do to survive and thrive in this new paradigm where we have uh, technologies that are growing and converging exponentially, as we've all been hearing about, where seemingly everything has become digitized and democratized, uh, empowering startups and individuals uh, like never before, where new business models uh, are threatening centuries-old institutions and, uh, and industries. How do companies find sources of new growth and retool their organizations to prepare themselves to thrive in this new future? So Clay, let me start by asking you to briefly describe your job's theory, and specifically how companies uh, can better anticipate future jobs uh, to inform the solutions that they need to be developing today. So if we're trying to skate to the puck, how do we do that if we can't walk outside our doors and observe future jobs to be done? Well, a couple of things that can be useful in trying to find opportunities to grow. And the first one is to look at what are people doing because what's available is too complicated and expensive. And almost always at the beginning, the solutions are complicated and expensive and so that the market is defined by people who have money and skill and access. And if you try to look at the bottom of the market and find people who historically couldn't use the product because they don't have enough money or skill, you give an opportunity to make it simpler and cheaper, then a whole new population of people will come into the market. But there's no data about people who are non-consumers. So the data guides us in the wrong direction. So that's the first one, is if somebody hasn't made a, a product that is complicated and expensive, almost always there's a, a market that can be created in that sense. The other is not, be, not to be de, um, misled by the accounting systems. So um, almost all companies are successful as they have become by innovation of one sort or another. But we try to make good products better. And we call these in my research sustaining innovations. And the markets exist. You know, and so just imagine that you are a, a Toyota uh, car owner and I work for Toyota, and I convince you to buy a Prius hybrid car, that'd be a real win, we think, except if you buy the Prius, you won't buy a Camry. Right. If I sell you our next best product for this year, you won't buy last year's best product. And so by their very net definition, sustaining innovations that make good products better the impact on growth is negligible because they are replacative rather than creating in character. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second reason for where to go to look for growth. Great. Thank you. I have so many more questions, but I'm going to ask John um, to do that something similar, and I want to talk about something foundational that you wrote actually about 10 years ago. Um, you wrote a series of posts about uh, Pareto power and leveraged growth, um, which I found particularly interesting given Singularity University is driving growth through its global community. Um, I was wondering if you could share what you mean by leveraged growth, um, why it's such an opportunity for organizations, and how it's different from more traditional approaches to growth. Sure. 
I need to begin, though, by saying what a pleasure it is to be with Clay. Uh, he and I go way back. <laughs> we actually first met when he joined BCG in 1979. Wow. I was already there, and we struck up a <laughs> friendship, and intersections have occurred over the decades, and it's just great to continue yeah, it's to... it's fun to be with you. <laughs> it's great. Um, so leverage growth. I, the, the focus here is on... I sit in boardroom meetings around, you know, the increasing pressure that companies have for growth. Uh, investors are no longer satisfied with profits, they want growth. Uh, and I find that inevitably when the conversation goes to growth, it quickly focuses on two options. There are two paths to growth. One is make, and the other is buy. And the only discussion is, what's the balance? How much are we going to make in terms of organic growth? And then how much are we going to buy in terms of acquisitions that will help us drive growth? My belief is that conversation misses an increasingly powerful third path to growth. And it's this notion of leveraged growth. And it's basically the notion of how can you create and deliver more and more value to the marketplace by mobilizing third-party capabilities that can add value to the customers that you're serving and where you capture some of that value for yourself. It's a very powerful way to grow. It reduces the investment required for growth. It typically accelerates the time to revenue growth because the capabilities are already out there. It's just a question of connecting them with, with the customers. And yet, it's not on the agenda. And I think that there are some challenges. I mean, I, I believe that to really do this effectively, first of all, you have to be able to expand your horizons in terms of what your customers' unmet needs are and think more broadly about the full range of needs that they have and where can you, in fact, mobilize third parties to help address those needs. Um, part of it, too, is a willingness to abandon what I think is one of the keystones of business today, which is the command and control mindset, right? The only way to be successful in business is to command and control all the resources that are necessary for success. And this in, in, inherently requires you to mobilize third-party resources that you're not going to command. You can shape and influence, but you're not going to command those resources. That's a big hurdle to overcome. And I think the other piece to the puzzle is that leveraged growth requires platforms of one type or another. And there's a whole set of discussions. First of all, a need to understand where and how platforms add value. But there's a discussion around, do we create our own platform for this leveraged growth? Or do we rely on third-party platforms to mobilize the resources that are needed by the customer? And where are the influence points that we need to own in order to continue to create value in this, in this approach to the marketplace? But I think at the end of the day, the power here is that you can create not just leverage in terms of accessing third-party resources, but if you do it right, you can accelerate learning because you're getting more and more participants involved in addressing customer needs, and that inherently will drive more insight into what those needs are and how to better serve them. And it will drive loyalty on the part of customers. You're demonstrating that you really want to serve their needs, and not necessarily just with your own products and services, but with whatever products and services are most relevant to the customer. So I think, um, and at the end of the day, the real power of of leveraged growth is network effects, the opportunity to really create exponential value as you add more and more participants into the mix. So I wonder, Clay, if you could add your thoughts to that. In the breakfast that you hosted for some of our alumni earlier this morning, a, a question came up about the role of communities and open versus closed systems and how uh, your theory thinks about those. I know you don't have an opinion, but your theories do. So I wonder if you could um, perhaps suggest how your theories think about the role of community and, open, and openness. Tough questions, Karen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me offer two things to add. The first one is I'm increasingly trying not to use the word theor um, innovation because there are types of innovation. 
Yes. And I need to have a portfolio of investments and I need to balance the different types of innovations. So the first type of innovation is this is emerging in our minds. We call market creating innovation. And they make products that historically were complicated and expensive into something that is so much more affordable, as we talked about just now, that a whole new population of people have access. So they create a new market. The second type, which we've talked about, are sustaining innovations that make good products better, and they don't create, in aggregate, much new growth. But they make the good products that we have merit better margins, and that's very important. And then the third type of innovation we're calling efficiency innovations, to figure out how to do more with less. So the Toyota production system was an efficiency innovation. Walmart is an efficiency innovation. And by their very nature, they eliminate jobs and don't create growth for the community. So you have these three types of innovations. What's happening in our system is we measure success by metrics like RONA, internal rate of return, and so on. And when entrepreneurs in a company come with, come with ideas to make better products, they have to decide which should we invest in and which should we not invest in. And these metrics, especially IRR, causes us not to invest or incapable of investing in growth opportunities because market creating innovations take five to 10 years. And so if we invest in those products, IRR goes down. On the other hand, if we invest in efficiency innovations, um, IRR goes up because we invest only in things that pay off in the short term. And increasingly, as a result of these ways that we measure things, um, we're investing to create cash, which we then use to make more cash, which we use to make more crap, more cash. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> free cash flow is just the metric that, that everybody but because the metrics that we use misguide our thinking, we invest in a strategy that doesn't yield growth. And that's a, that's a really important insight that we've got. Then the other one is, I, I think I agree, John, 100% with what you're saying. It, with the caveat, that a strategy is always only temporarily correct. A strategy that works here in this context, if we find ourselves in this context, that strategy doesn't work. And we need to always remember that as a, as a principle. So at the beginning of an industry, when the products are not good enough for what markets need, Almost always, the architecture of products or services are proprietary and interdependent. Uh, and the reason why, the product isn't good enough. And that means that the leaders in the industry, they can't change one thing unless they change everything. Yes. And that means that they have to do everything. It's very hard to outsource because you don't know how to spec what you're outsourcing. And so at the beginning of an industry, IBM in mainframe computers, um, Intel in processors, they have to do everything to do anything. And they can't be modular and open. So what that means is that the product that they produce cannot be a platform. You have to do everything. Not, there's not a platform possible. But when the product becomes more than good enough, then the architecture, little by little, opens up. And it becomes modular. And that's at the point in which 
you can have third party players start to contribute and a community can coalesce. I don't know if I did all right with that, but it's, there is a particular situation in which that kind of a community building works and when doesn't it work and that relates to is the products good enough that we can modularize the product or do we still need to play in an interdependent world? That's great, thank you. That's very relevant for many of us in the audience, I know. I wanna <clears throat> build on that by asking you uh, both, actually, about the innovator's dilemma. That's what I think of when I hear you talking, simply because I've been in many, experience, uh, many uh, organizations where we have tried to invest in transformational innovation, new sources of growth, and that tension between next quarter's earnings report and investing in our future was so real, and so often those projects got shut down. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, since the book was written, um, you know, how has, has the innovator's dilemma evolved or is it just stronger than ever? And particularly for both of you, what structures have you seen work uh, well in helping organizations address this challenge? Who's getting it right today? Oh, boy. Can you ask the different question, which is, does anybody get it right? <laughs> it's, yes. It's tough. That is a question. You know? is, is anybody getting it right? Can I tell you a story? Of course. <laughs> so this happened a num years ago, and I was just in my office minding my own business, and Secretary William Cohen of the Secretary of Defense called me up out of the blue. And um, I'd never met the man before, but he said, I read this book of yours, The Innovator's Dilemma, and I wondered if you'd come down to the Pentagon and talk to us about why you did this research. And for me, as a chance of a lifetime, you know, so I said, of course I... And he wanted me to t present my work to his staff. And I'd been in the secretary's work uh, office before when I was in the Clinton, or the Reagan administration. And the, the staff was about six or eight people. And that's what I was investing and planning on. But he met me in the entrance of the Pentagon and guided me into his conference room. And there were about 50 people there. And he took me to the front and as he did so, he said, you need to know this is the first time when I have been able to assemble my entire staff. Wow. And I said, my gosh, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, quote, just present your stuff. <laughs> And then he brought me to the front and introduced me to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Wow. And then the other members of this, the, and then the secretaries of Army, Navy, Air Force, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and behind them, the undersecretaries and deputy secretaries, and then behind them, all the other assistants. So about 45 or 50 people there. <clears throat> and so I said, well, let me tell you about this little model. So I described the theory of disruption and then I said to help you visualize what we're talking about. I had done a study of the steel industry and described how mini mills came at the bottom of the market and the big integrated steel companies got out of the low end and focused on higher margin, gross margin products like sheet steel and the mini mills just started to make better and better products. And, and in the end, the, the integrating steel companies essentially got killed. And uh, when I was done with that, General Shelton, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, called me up. And he said, you have, you're clueless about why we're interested in this, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, I actually am clueless. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, can I draw on your diagram there? And this is back when you had chalk. <laughs> and he, the high end of the market is sheet steel, that you make cars and appliances. And he erased steel, or sheet steel, and he wrote Russians. <laughs> and they are the most demanding market we ever <clears throat> see. And then he said what you call the integrated steel companies, that are making everything. He raised that and he said, we call that the US Department of Defense. <laughs> oh 
And then at the bottom of the market where I had rebar, he wrote down terrorism. And then what you call the mini mills, uh, he erased that and he said, we call that non-nation nations like Al-Qaeda. And he said, there isn't anything about the way we're trying to do our business in sh with sheet steel that, and doing everything for everybody that give, gives us any hope of counter uh, uh, the terrorists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then he sat down. And then everybody's hand went up. And the question was, has anybody ever been successful when they're caught at the bottom to catch the wave on the oar? And I said, well, we're not done with the study yet, but our sense is that never has any company ever succeeded in catching this new wave unless they set up a completely separate company. Because the problem is the old game doesn't go away. And if you ask that to do the new game, it doesn't do it well. And, and so, you, so we talked about how you do this. Anyway, it went on for about two hours, and then we ran out of time. Two months later, Secretary Cohen called me up, and he said, you need to know that today we're announcing that we're setting up a different, a fourth unit wow. in the Department of Defense. We call it the Special Forces Command. That can be organized it, with Navy, Army, and Air Force, all inter, inter, so that we could address it successfully. And uh, he said, I just thought you ought to know. And then he said, Well, thank goodness that there's a theory, but he said, the. Um, <laughs> We have been working on this problem for eight years, six years, and we haven't been able to solve it because you sit around a table and there's no data about the future. And so I have opinion about how to organize ourselves this way and somebody else that way, and we talk past each other. And the secretary said, finally, the theory gave us a way of framing the problem and gave us a vocabulary so that we can understand how what is counterintuitive actually is logical. And that changed my life, you know, because um, um, a way to frame the model and a way to the vocabulary to have that be in common, I think is actually really important yeah. if we have in a big successful corporation people who still need to make the old work game work. We need the vocabulary to do this one while we do that one. Yeah. I'm sorry for that, but it, it made a difference in my life to realize how important that was. Well, and many others as well. So thank you for that work. Um, it's had a profound impact, I'm sure, on many people here. I encounter, uh, as both of you do as well, many organizations that don't have that vocabulary and are still wrestling with how to do both and um, experimenting, saying they want to establish a team on the edge, but not really sort of navigating the relationship between the core and the edge successfully. Yeah. So I wonder, John, you talk a lot and you write a lot about scaling edges, and we've had some fun debates on stage about that sounds great, but in my experience and many others, it just never happens as easily as it sounds like it should. So I wonder if you could share uh, a little bit about the scaling edges theory and um, perhaps give some examples very, very briefly, because we have 10 minutes left, um, <laughs> of what you've seen work well. Sure. He can, he can give us a short answer because he's not an academic. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge accepted, right, John? I mean, really. <laughs> so um, the notion of scaling edges has come about based on the work research we've been doing at the Center for the Edge, which is addressing the question that executives have uh, increasingly is, you know, in this big shift world, exponential age, uh, you're telling us we need to be way over here, but we're way over there. How the hell do we get from here to there? And it deals with the transformation challenge that I think all large companies face. I don't think anyone is exempt. Um, but the challenge is that 
transformation as typically performed, which is top-down, big bang approaches to transformation, in my experience, have a very high failure rate. And it's not just my experience. All the academic studies show anywhere between 70 to 80 percent of those efforts fail to achieve a single objective. So our belief is there's a need for an alternative approach. And the good news, we believe, is that actually a lot of the exponential forces that are reshaping the business environment make this approach much more feasible. Uh, and it's what we call scaling edges. It has to do with the notion of finding an, an edge to the existing business, something that has relatively modest profits, revenues. Um, but if you understand the exponential forces that are reshaping the markets you're in, has the potential to scale to the point not just where it becomes an interesting alternative business or diversification, but it will become the new core of your company, of your business over time. It will scale to that level. And part of the reason we focus on this notion of scaling edges is because, again, as I've gone through the business world now for decades, I've developed an enormous respect for what I describe as the immune system of large traditional organizations. And my belief is the reason the top-down approach to uh, change, uh, to transformation, fails is because the immune system is so powerful. It will mobilize and crush any efforts to change. And so I take inspiration from uh, the art of war, which is wherever possible, avoid confrontation with your enemy. Uh, if you have to do battle, you've already lost the war. Scaling edges says don't do battle with the enemy. Find an edge, focus on scaling that edge, and do it in ways that reduce the potential resistance. So part of it has to do with the notion of in the edge initiatives, we have what we call starving the edge. It's actually don't give it a ton of money in the early stages. Because the more money you give it in the early stages, the more that immune system is going to come out and attack. That money's coming from somewhere, and I guarantee you they're going to want it back. So starve the edge. Focus on short-term initiatives that can actually demonstrate tangible impact. And I agree completely with uh, Clay on this, which is avoid the financial metrics. Focus on operating metrics that are the leading indicators of, operating, of financial performance. And demonstrate that there, that there is an accelerating scaling in those operating metrics. But at the end of the day, um, our belief is that is the way to avoid this uh, exciting the immune system and, and bringing it down. I think the, um, so you asked a couple of examples. I mean, there aren't a lot of examples. I will certainly put it up front, but I believe it's because this approach is really only becoming truly viable now. Um, but some early examples that I think are interesting, one is State Street Bank, one of the oldest banks in the United States. 1793 was when it was founded. Through most of its history, it was a traditional retail bank. It had branches, it basically took deposits, gave loans. Back in the 1970s, started to experience increasing pressure on the margins in their core business. One of the executives in the bank came up with this idea one day. He said, you know, we have world-class back office transaction processing capability in our bank. Radical idea. Why don't we rent out that capability to other commercial banks that are experiencing similar kinds of pressures. Long story short, that was an edge to the bank. They took some spare capacity that they had, started making it available, rental to uh, commercial institutions. Today, they scaled that edge to the point where it is now the core of their business. They basically have shut down, scaled back all their retail operations. It's all about um, this new business, which has become the new core. Uh, there's another example in China, Lian Feng, and I won't go into the details on that, but they transformed their business from a very narrow transaction processing, outsourcing kind of business to what I would describe as a trusted advisor business to apparel designers. And they started it with a new business unit with three people in it. And they scaled that because they were addressing an unmet need on the part of the customers to the point where it became the new core of their business 
And they ended up firing the remaining deal makers that were part of their, part of their original core because they couldn't make the, trend, the change. So I do think, and I will say just <laughs> at the risk of going on a bit longer, the, the, this notion of the immune system, I, I have very much come to believe that if you believe a transformation process is rational, you've already lost. Transformation process is fundamentally political and it has to do with the immune system and the immune system has to do ultimately with emotions, not facts and data and analysis, but with emotions. And if you don't understand the emotions of the people that you're dealing with and acknowledge them and address them in a way that allows you to move forward, you will lose. And so it's a hard thing for me to have learned having come from business school where it was all about the data, all about the analysis and, you know, getting that, getting that right. Uh, I've increasingly come to believe that you have to focus on the people and the emotions and that's ultimate. And, and I will say too, I'm often interpreted as saying the immune system are, is evil. They're evil people. No, they are extremely well-intentioned people. They are wanting to do the right thing for the company. It's not that they're evil, but their actions frustrate the ability to do transformation. So anyway, just... Thank you. That was great. And there's a lot more depth <laughs> there, so you should talk to John for more, more information on this. So I want to... I've got two more questions left for you. This next one is a lightning round question, um, which might be challenging for the academics on stage, um, but I will challenge you with a one-sentence answer to this. Uh, some with no semicolons. 140 characters. 140 characters. Uh, <laughs> some people in the high-tech world um, talk about uh, the impact of all of this digitization and uh, you know, emerging technologies. Um, the impact will be that the organization goes away. So in a sentence or less, um, what is the future of the organization as an entity, as a structure in 10, 50 years? Digitization is the essence of modularity. And when it is modular, you can innovate very quickly because how the systems fit together are well-defined and so you don't have to do everything. You just do one piece and the rest of the system provides all the others. And so when you see a, an acceleration of innovation, almost always at its core, it is modularity which exists because of digitization of what previously was analog. And so you have to ask the question, will, are there other new markets in which interdependence and modularity are critical? And you have to say yes, because we don't know everything that is not known. Yeah. And as modularity accelerates, and, and so we can, we can outsource innovation because the rules are well understood and allow smart people like this to focus on the next generation of interdependent systems which are going at the edge. So I actually have a lot of hope for mankind. That's a bold conclusion there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, John, how about you? Yeah, so we've done a lot of research on this topic and uh, the, the answer, perhaps in classic consulting fashion that we've come up with, is it depends. Um, and the, the, the next level down, just to drill down one more level, is that we believe that the forces, the digital forces and exponential forces that are playing out in the landscape are going to significantly fragment major parts of the economy. I don't believe we're going to go down fully to the individual contractor or free agent, but I believe smaller and smaller businesses will be the most profitable and successful in those parts of the economy. But at the same time, in other parts of the economy, we're going to see concentration and consolidation to levels that have never been seen before. And actually, the interesting thing is these two trends reinforce and play off each other. But if you're a large company or want to be a large company, you got to think really carefully about what parts of the economy are going to concentrate and consolidate because that's where you want to be. But if your aspiration is just to build a profitable small business, right, there are other parts of the economy where that will become much more viable. 
Thank you. So I have a final question, and Will, I am going to take the five minutes you said I could take if there was something uh, interesting going on. <laughs> um, so this is for both of you. Um, and this is a fundamental, fundamentally important question to those of us at Singularity and in Silicon Valley and I think the world today. How should leaders think about the impact of the innovations that they choose to pursue, the moral, the ethical, the human implications. Workforce displacement from automation is a clear example. Uh, Uber would be another example of disruption sort of unmoored uh, from organizational ethics. What are your thoughts on that? I had a gentleman come to see us a number of years ago. He was a Marxist economist from China. And he, he had received a Fulbright Fellowship to come to Boston to study religion and democracy of all of the strange topics. <laughs> and Christine and I got to know him quite well while he was in Boston. And before he returned home, we asked him if he learned anything that was, he just never anticipated before. And with any, without any hesitation, he said, yeah. I had no idea how critical religion is to the functioning of democracy. And I had never put these things together in my mind, but this guy this comes in from Mars and para parachutes in to Boston. And he, what he described as the reason why religion is so critical for democracy is that religion causes people to voluntarily choose to obey the laws because they believe that society can't hold them accountable and they believe that God ultimately will hold us accountable for doing what's right. And so in America, because most people most of the time voluntarily choose to obey the law, and it's rooted in our religions, he said democracy works. But if you look around the world where Americans have tried to install democracy, and you don't have a foundation of it, of not any religion, but a religion that causes people voluntarily to choose to obey the law, all you get is chaos. Yeah. And he said, I worry about America because your religions are going off the cliff and losing their ability to cause people voluntarily to do what democracy requires. And, uh, and I worry about that. As do I, as do I think many of us. So thanks for sharing that, Clay. John, how about you? Um, it's a huge question, much longer conversation. I, I do believe that uh, clearly uh, ethics, morality are going to be increasingly central to business success. I think trust is actually going to be a key determinant of who succeeds in this increasingly competitive environment. And in that context, if you don't show a commitment to ethics and morality, you're not going to have the trust, sorry, uh, not possible. But uh, more broadly, I would just also advocate that we need to think more broadly about the business opportunities related to ethics and morality. So just two quick examples, uh, some quite controversial. One is diversity, and the other is automation and elimination of jobs. I actually believe both of those, yes, they are morally important and should be pursued, but the more important statement for me is actually both of those are critical to business success. The way we will create value is by having more diversity within our organizations and, by the way, fostering within that diversity productive friction so there are people willingness and ability to challenge each other to come up with even more creative ideas so you're not just doing diversity because it's good, morally good. You're doing it because it is critical to business success. You will not come up with the most creative answers and approaches unless you have a diverse workforce. So I think that's the kind of debate that we should be having. Thank you.
You want to end on the applause? <laughs> okay. Um, there are so many things that unfortunately we didn't have time to cover. I want to thank both of you so sincerely for the work and the research that you've both dedicated your lives to. Um, we're all very grateful for that. I'm grateful to have had this opportunity to speak with each of you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for being here today, and I hope the rest of the day is as inspiring. Thank you.